Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. I'm your host, Renee Bauer, and I am here with Amberly Lago today. Amberly is an author and motivational speaker and the host of her own podcast called True Grit and Grace Podcast. She has a best selling book called Grit and Grace Turning Tragedy into Triumph which tells the story of how her life was forever altered by a devastating motorcycle accident and the victory she discovered through her recovery. In this memoir, she weaves the tale of her childhood and early adulthood alongside the grueling process of healing from 34 surgeries and, and also being diagnosed with chronic regional pain syndrome. She has been, a pair, uh, been featured in The Doctors, The Today Show, and Health and Shape Magazine, amongst many others. And she's also divorced twice and now married again. Amberly inspires her readers and followers to thrive even when their circumstances have narrowed their possibilities. And she delivers hope and encouragement to everyone. So I just knew I had to have her on, and there's so many topics I want to talk about. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, Renee, thank you so much um, for having me on, and thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm just, I want to hang out with you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. So I guess let's just start with, um, I mean, your journey is is so filled with so many uh, opportunities for growth and um, so many things that really could turn someone's life upside down and make the really take them out at their knees. So let's start when you're 38 years old, you get into this devastating uh, motorcycle accident and it just shook your world. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I think that a lot of times we're going through a difficult situation and at the time we it's hard to see light at the end of the tunnel. It's hard to understand, you know, why these things are happen happening. And I think if we get caught up in why me, why did this happen? It can take us down um, a road of despair and depression. I know it was for me um, when I was 38, I was, you know, I had, like you had mentioned before, I had been divorced twice and I thought that that's it. I'm done with men. I am, mm -hmm. I am just going to, I've got a daughter, I've got my career. And then I met the man of my dreams and I was like, okay, maybe third time's the charm. And so, you know, I had, um, we had a baby. We didn't think we were going to be able to have a baby. We'd been trying for a couple of years and we finally had um, a baby. My career was booming. I had just started doing fitness videos again. Um, I, you know, was sponsored by Nike. So life was good and yeah. everything changed in an instant when I was coming home from work and an SUV shot out of a parking lot. They made a left and I was going straight. And so they hit me. I was T-boned and then thrown yeah. 30 feet. And as I was sliding across the asphalt, I didn't know if I was going into oncoming traffic. And I just remember thinking, please just don't let another car hit me. And when I came to a stop, I looked down at my leg and it was just broken into pieces. Blood was squirting out like one of those horror movies because my femoral, I didn't know it at the time. Thank goodness I didn't know this, but my femoral artery was severed. And so I was basically bleeding out. I didn't know that you can bleed out pretty quick. I got, I had a guy made a tourniquet on my leg right away. And one of the first thoughts that I had was, Oh gosh, I may have to train clients on crutches for a while. Like, Oh my God, that's and, what you're and, thinking in that moment. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I think looking back, you know, that was one of my defaults was how can I go around this? What am I going to do next? Like mm -hmm. my default is to find a solution and usually a solution that's going to make me happy or bring me joy. And for me, my joy is working with other people and seeing them grow. And I thought, well, how am I going to do that? You know, oh, I'll have to do it on crutches. And so I didn't even realize that at the time, but that, that was the thought going through my head. I, however, I had no idea just how serious it was um, until like people, I looked and people didn't 
like run over to me. I mean, thank God there was that guy that made a tourniquet, but I could tell by the people's faces because they were just walking up to me really slow and they looked scared and one lady fainted. And I was like, wow, this must be really bad because this lady just fainted. And then the paramedics got there. And I remember thinking, okay, you know, when you look into somebody's eyes for like reassurance or how bad is this, or I'm okay. Right. right? And I remember the paramedics wouldn't look at me. He wouldn't make eye contact with me. And I thought, oh my God, that was the first thought of, am I dying? Am I going to live through wow. this? And when I got to the ER, it was crazy. The room was packed with cops because my husband is a cop and, and word travels fast in the um, brotherhood and sisterhood mm -hmm. of the police force. And they thought maybe I was a cop that had been hit, but my husband was there and I heard just this crying, like wailing. And I was like, what is that? And it was my husband. I'd never oh seen God. him cry. He's this big, strong man. And so that was another thing. I was like, oh my gosh, this must be really bad. And I told him, honey, I need you to get over here and be strong for me. Because at that time I thought I may never wake up from this. They were that said, I'm going to give you something to make you feel all better. And that was the last thing I remembered before I was put in induced coma. When I woke up, they told me, you know, you're, you have a 1% chance of saving your leg. So we're going to go ahead and amputate it. And I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, 1%. So there's still a chance. I said, then I want to fight to keep my leg. And I think that's where, you know, we're given a choice. And I think that when you realize you have a choice, you don't always have a choice. And, you know, when a car comes plowing into you. You don't always have a choice and whether you get fired from a job or, or you have a spouse that cheats on you and, and leaves the relationship or so many things, but we do have a choice in how we're going to choose hope, how we're going to choose faith, how we're going to choose our attitude, how we're going to make um, a decision to make our life the best that it can possibly be despite our circumstances. And so that 1% chance was my glimmer of hope. And I think sometimes that's all we need is just that little glimmer of hope. Maybe that 1%, that person, that one person that says, I believe in you, I've got you, um, to get us through those hard moments. And so it's really been a journey. It took 34 surgeries to save my leg from amputation. And it has taken really year, it took a couple of years of in and out of a wheelchair, but that's a blessing too, because um, I was told I'd be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. And now I can work out. I can, I can't run the way I used to, but I can run to chase after my daughter and I have even <laughs> feet her sometimes, but um, you know, I, I was diagnosed with a nerve disease called complex regional pain syndrome, which is dubbed the suicide disease because it leaves me in constant chronic pain. And when I was diagnosed with that disease, it was really truly the beginning of, of where I had to dig deep to find grit. Mm -hmm. And by the grace of God, I was able to pull out of my darkest moment and start to find joy again. And so I want to tell anybody who's listening to this and who might be struggling right now, because I think a lot of us are struggling with yeah. so much uncertainty and so many job losses and, and even deaths. And, you know, my brother had COVID and he's, he's fine. He recovered. Um, but I think it's, it's been a, probably yeah. one of the toughest moments for a lot of people in this past year and, um, that hope is always available and happiness is a choice. And we have the ability to manufacture that happiness. You know, it's not something that's given to us, but we can make it, um, through our daily choices. So did you, that the disease that you were diagnosed with, was that because of the accident or was that like the cherry on top after the accident? Yeah. Well, that was, um, so I was hit by the car and I was in a lot of pain, but I thought that's part of it. My legs crushed. I've got steel yeah. rods and, you know, in my leg and my leg, you know, it looked like it 
hurt. And so <laughs> when doctors would see it, and so I wasn't diagnosed with CRPS until about three and a half months after the accident when there I was like so proud to be upright on crutches. And I remember getting dressed that day to go to the doctor's appointment and thinking in my head, he's going to be so proud of me. I have worked so hard to push through this pain and to cowgirl up and to just suck it up and keep going. And he's going to be so proud of me. And I walked in his office and he, the look on his face, he looked at me and he ran out of the room and I thought, I looked at my husband. I said, well, that's not really the reaction I was hoping for. <laughs> like, he doesn't look very proud. He looked more scared and I knew something was wrong and he came back and he did some tests on me and he said, you've got something very serious. And I was like, yeah, I got hit by an SUV. It's pretty serious. <laughs> and he goes, no, you have a disease. And so that's when I was diagnosed the first time and I didn't want to believe it. And so I was like, screw that. I do not have this disease. This, uh -uh. I am going to fight to prove him wrong and to get my life back. And the pain was getting worse and worse. And so I went to another doctor and I was like, didn't, I just was like, you know, this other doctor said a little something and I don't think he's right, but I just thought I'd get a checkup. And he was like, yeah, you know, I don't think you've got CRPS, but let's examine you anyway, because to look at me, I don't look sick. Right. Right. And then they're like, okay, well take your, take your boots off. Let's take a look at your leg and do a couple of tests. And he, I took my boot off and he goes, Oh no, you definitely have it. And I was oh, like wow. crushed. And so I still didn't want to believe it. I went to a third doctor. And the third doctor, when the third doctor told me, and he even, he did a house call and he came to the house and we went outside, we were sitting on the back patio. And when he told me, I just, I broke down in tears because I really felt like I had been giving, given like a life sentence of yeah. the life as you know, it is over. You're never going to be able to work again. You'll never run again. You need to get back in your wheelchair and put your leg up. I was devastated because running was my drug of choice. Running and exercise is what kind of the only tool that I had. And when I couldn't do that is when I really spiraled down into a depression. And that's where I had to figure out pretty quickly how to pull myself back out of that. And I learned that it's not about sucking it up and pushing mm. through pain all the time. It's about really listening to your body and having self-compassion and learning to love yourself through the mess and through, you know, the imperfections and the failures and the setbacks. And when you can do that, man, that's when you can really start to live a life of joy, when you can just be in acceptance for where you are. And that was hard for me. I did not want to not only accept, you know, my situation, but I hated the way I looked. I was very ashamed of the way I looked. I thought, you know, how, I mean, I even got to the point where I was like, this is not, I'm not the woman that my husband married. He could find a better wife. My kids could find another mother. Oh my I could gosh. Be better off if I was just gone. They don't, they deserve more. I was worthless. I felt worthless. Um, I was the main breadwinner of the family and now I was out of work. We had, $2.9 million worth of medical bills. I mean, my stepmother committed suicide. My little brother was just sentenced to death row in Texas. They don't screw around there. <laughs> and so life sucked. I mean, yeah. it was bad. It was really bad. And plus I couldn't move the way that I used to. I mean, at one time I even, you know, was when I was confined to the bed, the hospital bed, I even had to rely on my husband to carry my bedpan for me. So I always think when I'm, I'm nervous about something or I'm worried about something, or if I'm having a tough time with a decision, um, or I'm like, I was so nervous to do my Ted talk. I think, if I can get through those yeah. times, I can get up on that stage and give that talk. And so I really highly suggest anybody who's listening, the hardest thing you've ever been through, 
think about that and how you got through it. So the next time you're struggling and you're like, oh my God, how am I going to get through this? You think about that last hard thing and you're like, I got through that. I can do this. It gives you the confidence and the boost you need to keep moving forward. Yeah, that's, that's such great advice. Now, so let's talk about your divorces because right before we started recording, we both <laughs> shared that we are both twice divorced and, and married a third time. Um, but we also shared that, you know, we both had shame around it. And mm -hmm. um, so let, you know, let's talk a little bit about that and how you um, learn to trust again and love again and commit again after that. Yeah. You know, it took me a long time to trust again. I got married the first time when I was younger, I was 23 and I was eight mm -hmm. months pregnant and I really didn't, I knew he was not the man for me. Like I knew in my heart, he wasn't the man, but I was pregnant. And you know, when my family in Texas, they're old school. I mean, I come from the Bible Belt. And when I told them when I was, I was pregnant and I was moving in with my boyfriend, it was like, that was very shameful to them. And so I felt, I felt that shame. And so I thought, well, I'm going to get married and make this right. And plus it'll make it easier, mm -hmm. you know, to bring her in the hospital. We have the same last name and, and that I, my gut was right. And I think, you know, your gut never lies. Like yeah. you always have to listen to your gut because mm -hmm. your head will try to tell you otherwise and your heart will too, but your gut never lies. And I knew it wasn't right. And it was really wrong. I mean, we, I'm not going to tell you all the horrible things that happened, but um, I thought that I could forgive the, the cheating. And when it got worse than cheating, I was like, okay, I'm out. I don't want to raise my daughter around someone who is that, that she, for her to think that it's okay for a woman to be treated as poorly as I was being treated. I want more for my daughter. So she was my inspiration for walking out. And that was scary because I barely worked. Um, I left, he had ran up, I had given him, you know, I bought a car for him. He stopped making payments on the car. I had a credit card for him. He maxed out the credit card. So I had nothing. And it was really hard just to pay the rent every month. And then when my daughter was like two years old, so not that much longer, I met a man who he's, he's an incredible man. I mean, to this day, if he called me and said he needed something, I would be there. Okay. What do you need? I'm there for you. Like he is an incredible man, incredible man. He is an incredible father figure to my daughter. And I remember when I met him at first, you know, I had a friend that wanted to introduce me. And I remember when I met him, I was like, Oh my God, this guy's so gorgeous. And then he was from Texas like me and he was seemed very, you know, he was successful and so nice. And he was so sweet to my daughter. And the first time I introduced him to my daughter, my daughter was in her diaper and she looked at him and she was like, I like him. And I was like, <laughs> okay, done deal. She likes him. And so it was like, it moved very fast. And I think he made me feel safe. He made me feel, um, he was such a good father figure for her. But then I realized quickly, you know, that that's what he was. He was a good father figure for her, but it wasn't necessarily the greatest match for me. And I was like, I want so much more. I want mm. to keep continue. Like I want to, I was very motivated and just beginning my career and like, and he got stuck and depressed and, and it was hard. And so I made the decision to leave and I thought, well, I'm good. I don't really want to be with anyone. You know, I walked away from our home. So he got the house and um, again, I was starting over from scratch and I thought, you know, I'm building up my career and I was single for years. And then after that, 
I would not let anyone around my daughter. When I did start to date, I dated a guy for a little while and we dated for over a year before I even introduced him to my daughter. I was like just really protective of her. And then when she was 11, I met my current husband. And um, when I met my current husband, (laughs) he pursued me for like a month hard. I mean, I'm talking, he would actually pull me over in the cop car. I would be, I mean, every night, every night I would get off work and be driving home and hear sirens and it would be him. And I can say that now because he's retired and he won't get in trouble. Um, But I met him and I don't know. I just remember he, you know, we met and he asked me to go away with him after the first month. And I was like, go away for a weekend. I was so nervous. And to let that wall down of, of, you know, trusting that he was going to be okay. And that I could introduce him to my daughter. It was, it was a process, but I remember we went jet skiing and I remember looking back at him and he was like taking care, loading up the jet skis and he had a car and he was a cop. And I thought this guy has his shit together. Like I don't have to take care of him. I don't have to support him financially. He can support himself. Like finally, I think I got a good one. Like, and we have fun together and he made me laugh and, and he made me feel so safe, but I still, did not trust because I had, you know, everything, money and everything taken away from me in the first marriage. The second marriage was not so great. I walked away from the house. And so I thought I still, it wasn't until my motorcycle accident that we, we had separate accounts Mm -hmm. because I was like, okay, yep, I'm going to marry you and I'll have a baby with you, but I'm going to have my own bank account. (laughs) Okay. Like it was, it was a process and it wasn't until I was in a coma and he couldn't pay the bills because we had separate accounts that we realized, Oh my gosh, no, we got married. We have a baby together. We can have separate accounts, but we need to have access to each other's accounts in case God forbid something like that happens. And so I didn't realize that I had this issue around trust and my finances until that happened. And I think I was able to let go of a lot of the shame around being divorced twice because, man, when you are laying in a hospital bed and you don't know whether or not this is the day they're going to amputate your leg or not, you don't even know if you're going to die because, I mean, there was at one point I went septic, so I was put in ICU and they didn't know if I was going to live through that. When you go through those moments, it's like, eh, you learn to let stuff go, the, the little stuff go. And I'm like, and when you can be in acceptance for, you know, that those were learning experiences yeah. for me. Like I learned to, to have more self-respect and, and I went to a therapist when I was with this one guy, I was in, I was in a lot of therapy going, Oh God, help me, man. I thought I picked a good one. And I think I got a, a loser again. You know, and she said, I was like, he's doing this and he's doing that. And then she said, you know, you, we teach people how to treat us. So you're teaching him that it's okay to treat you that way. And so that was a big moment of like, oh yeah, she put it on me like to really take some accountability for my part in the relationship. And so every relationship I've been in, I don't regret, I don't regret my first marriage because I learned that I'm a strong woman. I can take care of myself and I can be an example for my daughter of how a loving relationship should look like. And, and he gave me the gift of my daughter, my second relationship. I learned so much about that too, about myself, about how to be in a relationship. I definitely made a lot of mistakes. And, and now this relationship, you know, I'm still learning and, and just navigating your way around, um, going through difficult situations, I think that it can either tear you apart or it can be an opportunity to, you know, bond you even closer. And for us, thankfully, not that our relationship is perfect by any means. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. 
it's <laughs> like, it's, it, it's comical at sometimes. Yeah. It's like, oh my goodness, it's crazy. But we have managed to, you know, we're, we have a bond that's so tight because what I've gone through wasn't just my, it's, yeah. it's not my story. It's our story. And, and I've told him, this isn't my book. This is our book. This is our journey together. And so, um, for that, uh, it's his third marriage too. And I remember he would tell people, Oh, well, this is both of our third first, you know, third marriages. And if this doesn't work out, he's like, I, I think I'm just going to go gay. <laughs> and I'm like, honey, <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> what to each their own, but no. And I would, I would have like a lot of shame when he would like yeah. say that at a dinner party. And now I'm just like, it is what it is. And when you can just let yeah. go of that shame, it's very freeing. Yeah. And you know what? It, it's, I had that same thing and I felt the shame and I was almost like embarrassed to talk about it. And then you, you kind of switch how you think about it. And you're like, you know what? I respected myself enough to walk away from a relationship that had its season and wasn't yeah. serving me anymore. And to, to move towards something different, regardless of what that looks like. And now look at like, had you stayed in that second one because you were, were embarrassed to get divorced twice. I mean, think about what your life would be now compared to what it is. You know, exactly. and I think that that's so many people get stuck in that relationship because they don't want the divorce, the title of being divorced, or they, they don't want the embarrassment of saying, Hey, it didn't work out or, or was it, it was a failed marriage, which I don't think any relationship is, is a failure. It's all such a learning experience. Yeah, it is. And I mean, you know, I think you have to really ask yourself and, and pause long enough to get quiet with your emotions and let those feelings rise to the surface and, and ask yourself, you know, is this it? Is this okay? Am I good right. with this? Or am I meant for more? Do I want mm -hmm. more out of a relationship? And I mean, you know, in my second marriage, we, we went to therapy and, you know, I wanted to at least try and try going to therapy and try to work it out. But I think that, again, your gut, you yeah. know whether, for me, I, I can think about if I can picture myself doing something or being in, like, I can see myself growing old with my husband. I yeah. can see that. So I know, I know, I know that sounds kind of woo woo or wacky, but like, I can mm -hmm. see us growing together old. I knew my relationship was over with my second marriage when I would try, oh my gosh, I would try so hard to envision what that would look like growing old with him. And I just couldn't see it. I couldn't see us together. We were going in such different directions. I couldn't see us together. And, um, and so I, I think that I use that tool when I, I kind of try to envision what things would look like. Um, because I see it. I, I mean, I always say, oh, if I can see it, I can believe it. But I think sometimes if you can believe it, you can see it. And I'd be, I really believe that, you know, I'm going to be in a happy relationship with my husband for years to come. It's not that it's not going to have its um, rocky moments and difficult times. It's just, we change, we get older, everything changes. Right, and right. so, but, you know, I think that it's important to really look inside and ask yourself those questions. Um, are you really happy? So anytime I have an author on, I have to talk about the writing process and their journey because I'm a writer too. So what inspired you to write your book? And it is a best-selling book. And I know that your journey, like we're just scratching the surface of what is in your book and the journey that you've gone through and how you've come out of it. So when did you say, you know what, I need to put this all down on paper? And was that a healing process in and of itself? Oh, that was cathartic, but it was surprising because there were things that I wrote about in the book that I thought that I had dealt with. Mm -hmm. And it's so different when I actually hand wrote my whole entire book. Wow. I didn't even own a computer. Um, I wanted to write a book um, because I'd been asked to do um, several like speaking engagements and stuff and just like networking events and asked to like share my story. And so um, 
I had people go, you know, you should write a book because you could make a bigger impact. And I was like, well, that's what I really want to do is I want to give people hope and the inspiration and mm -hmm. the tools that they could use to get through hard times. And, and yeah, I want to, you know, if I can get through this and help somebody else, well, yeah, that's what I want to do. So my motivation for writing it was I, my big why was I wanted to be of service to others to help them climb out of, you know, whether it was alcoholism, depression, anxiety, trauma, chronic right. pain, divorce, sexual abuse. Um, and so that was my big why. So that allowed me to overcome the self doubt that I had. Cause I was like, who am I to write a book? You know, I had the major imposter syndrome, yeah. like, I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I don't even own a computer, but I was like, but, but no, I want to help others. So that's what I would use to continually like every day, just write, just write. And it took me two years to write my book. And so I share that it took me about two years. Well, I take that back two years from when I wrote it to got a publisher to got it published. I would say a two year span, which isn't I, that long in the publishing world. It's really not. Um, because I went with a hybrid publisher, the publishing phase was shorter. It was only mm -hmm. about a year. Um, but sometimes traditional publishing can be two years, two oh, and a yeah. half, sometimes years. It can be a long process. And so um, I share that because some people just think, oh, just, and maybe for some people it is easier just to write it, self-publish it, done. But for me, it was a process. It was very cathartic. And I, I, love that I wrote it on paper because I think it came out differently because when I'm on the, even when I'm typing up at something as simple as an Instagram post, if I'm typing it, it's different because in my mind I'm editing it and I'm yeah. trying to make it perfect. Mm -hmm. And when I write it just, it's just straight from my heart right on, on paper. And so I wrote it then, then had a lot of people saying, you'll never, be an author. You'll never do this. Who are you to write? I mean, I didn't have a lot of support. Um, and I was like, uh, well, I need a computer. So I went and bought a computer because I spent my whole life, you know, on the dance floor as a professional dancer. And then on the gym floor as a professional trainer, I didn't sit behind a desk ever. And so <laughs> that writing was very cathartic. And at one point, um, my editor actually came over and was like, I need to stop by your house and make sure you're okay. I just need to see to make it. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. So I need to make sure he goes, I feel like you've opened a can mm. of worms and, or, you know, open the lid off of a lot of past trauma. And I want to make sure that you, you're okay. And so it was very cathartic and I had no idea. And I don't think anyone in my family had any idea that it would actually, you know, be a bestseller. I remember sitting in, in this office on the floor and I had, when I got my books, I had a bunch of books stacked on the floor and I was bent down to take a picture. And my husband comes in the office. He's like, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm trying to come up with a post. I don't know how to post or market this. And so <laughs> Renee Brown, this is what she did. And I'm going to New York to be on the Today Show and she's going to be in New York to launch her book. And he said, well, don't you think she'll get upset if she sees your copying kind of what she did? And I said, honey, Renee Brown is never going to notice someone like me. <laughs> well, three days later, I go to New York. I'm on the Today Show. Megan Kelly's interviewing me. And my book hits bestseller in three categories that day because I was on the Today Show. That's Amazing. that's the power of media, and um, uh, not the, not necessarily anything I did. It's just the I mean, I worked hard to get it, but it was like it just shows you the power of being on national TV. Yeah. And so I look on Amazon. The publisher called and said, "Congratulations, we've never had an author hit numbers like this. You're a bestseller in three categories." And he goes, did you see? And I looked because I wasn't paying attention to that. I was just like, oh my God, yeah. I got to meet Megan Kelly. This is the <laughs> best day ever. And I looked and it was Brene Brown's book, True Grit and Grace and Dr. Wayne Dyer. I was in between two of my favorite authors. And so if there is anybody listening and they say 80% of people want to write a book that wants mm -hmm. to write a book, I say, go for it. Forget the naysayers. 
quit, you know, stop that negative mindset. If you've got that little voice, like I think we all do, you know, saying, who are you to do that? You know, you're not, you're too old, you're too young, you're not smart enough, whatever the voice is. Cause I had all those voices like mm-hmm. trying to talk me out, just do it Write a little bit every day. And you never can imagine the impact you can make. I mean, I was just in tears earlier because I got a message from a girl who has the same nerve disease as me. And she left me this long voice message like, well, there was like six of them of DMs because you go, they're going to only be a minute long on Instagram. And she left me DM saying how it changed her mindset in her life to read my book and to meet me through social media because she didn't know that she thought she's diagnosed and this was the life she was going to have. And sometimes it just takes that simple shift in perspective. And that's what I want to do for people. Shift your perspective so you can see different ways of getting through challenging times. Amberly, how do we find you? How do more people connect with you? Where do they find your book? Oh, well, you can always find me um, at amberlylago.com. And I hang out on Instagram a lot and I check all my DMs and try to respond to every single comment. My husband gets mad. He's like, why you can't respond to everybody, but (laughs) that's what I love. The best part of this whole journey is connecting with people. So, um, let me know that you heard me here on the show and send me a DM so I can, uh, connect with you. And if you want also, um, I, I love giving tools that people can really apply. And I think, I'm not sure when this will come out, but it's a new year and Mm -hmm. I've got a goals, grit and grace workbook to help you reach your goals, no matter what your circumstances are. If you text me, uh, just text the word grit, G-R-I-T to 818-214-7378 and you can get your free workbook. And I'll put all of that in the show notes as well. So I have one final question for you is because this episode will drop right in the new year. So do you believe in new year's resolutions? Uh, not, no, I think I believe in new year's intentions more than I do resolutions. I feel like even if you come up with one word, for the new year that that's man, that can be your word. Like that, like for me, a lot of what's been coming up for me is like clarity and quality. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think it's, it's maybe to try something new and pick a word that can be your focal point for the year that so, so matter what you're doing, like for quality, like no matter what kind of work I'm doing, it's quality work, no matter what kind of time I'm spending, it's with people, my family, it's quality time. So whatever that word may be for you, or I think last year, my word was resilience. I had no idea that we would be going into a pandemic. So that was a good word to pick. That's a great word. My word for 2021 is elevate. So I I love that. Yeah. So I am so grateful for this conversation. Thank you so much for sharing Everyone who's listening needs to grab a copy of this book because it goes so much deeper than what we can cover in this past half hour. You are truly an inspiration. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.